I don't know. So that's that's the stats strongly against the idea that you can explain what happens with change of debt using loanable funds and debt not mattering. So the loanable funds model has to be wrong. Well, let's look at what it actually, how it actually represented if you actually put it into a bank's balance sheet, because the idea is patient lends to impatient. That's the concept. Okay. So how do we actually put that together in double entry bookkeeping terms? What it would appear like is like this. There'd be nothing happening on the asset side of the bank, but there'd be a transfer from the patient to the impatient agent. And that's shown as plus to minus with the accounting convention that transfers you know, <coughs> credit debiting one account and crediting another. You show the debit as a plus because the liability liability goes down, the bank's liability goes down, the bank's liability of the borrower goes up, so that it's a minus. So that's that's the, the version there. Now the post Keynesian vision is the bank, and this is Sean Pater as well, creates a loan and creates a matching deposit at the same time. So you get a plus <coughs> on the asset side and a minus on the liability side, equally just as balanced as this, but rather different, which shows the money supply will grow by the amount of the loan. Now I can simulate this using this new software package I put together called Minsky. So I'll take you through the basic idea of building Minsky. I probably won't get it right doing it live. Well, let's give it a try. The idea of the software package is a, it's a palette on which you can draw economic relations. And there's plenty of software packages that I've shown you beforehand to do it. What my package adds is this capacity to add a bank. <coughs> so you create a bank, now I've got a banking icon. Double click on it, you get a table where you can enter double entry relations. Now, with the vision that, uh, and I'll call this a recruitment bank. Now, with Krugman's argument, you all you need to, to model the whole banking sector is just reserves on that side and as an asset, and two liabilities. First liability being patient, and the second liability being impatient. So there are my three accounts. And what patient does is goes and stashes the money in a bank. So the bank's got a liability matched by the reserve, which is the deposit. And then you have lending, which is the patient agent lending money to the impatient agent. So lend there and minus lend over here, all the actions on the liability side of the bank. Then of course you're going to have interest payments. And in this particular case, all the money that the patient has Impatient, rather, is coming from patient, so the transfer of the payment of interest has to be from patient, impatient to patient. And I'm going to guess that uh, maybe impatient's a capitalist, so what he's going to do with that money is hire workers. So there's also going to now be wage payments going from impatient to the to the employees and now that they've got money in their accounts they can consume so they're going to transfer consumption by workers from their accounts to the impatient agents accounts and impatient patients also going to consume so there's going to be consumption by patient as a transfer to the impatient agent. That's my overall model of the banking. You notice that the program is keeping track, making sure that all roads sum to zero there. So I've now defined a basic little system there. And I'm going to save that and call it Krugman. So having defined that, what I now want to do is say what those various elements are. So the first thing is lending. I'm going to copy lending, just right click and choose the object. I want to define what lending is based on. Well, lending is going to be based on what's happening with the amount of money patients got to spare. So I'm going to use an argument from systems engineering here and use what's called a, a time constant to say how rapidly patient lends money out of the account. And that's saying how over what how many years would it take patient if all patient did was lend money to impatient, how long would it be 
uh, until such time as there's no money left in patient's account. Well, I'm going to say it takes, say, 10 years to do that. So I therefore divide patient's account by the lending rate to get the amount that's actually being lent as a flow from patient to inpatient. And I've got to say what interest is. Well, that's pretty easy. Because there's going to be interest being charged on the rate of a loan. So the, you know, the loan is going to be represented by the actual amount of money in patient's account. The patient had no money before inpatient lent money to him or her. So let's now make this RL for the rate of interest on loans and make it 5%. And of course, you multiply the interest rate by the amount of loan to say what the interest payments are. So wire that up. And now I have to define wages. This is slightly more complicated because what's actually going on, if I'm saying inpatient is the firm sector, then the money passing through inpatient's account in a year is GDP. And part of GDP is going to go to workers as wages and part's going to go to inpatient as profits. So I've got to multiply uh, the amount of money flowing through by the proportion that workers are going to get. So I call it wage share. And let's say it's 70%, which is pretty much you know, within the ballpark of what workers actually get of GDP. So wages are going to be something, 70% so of something. Well, the something that's going to be is the turnover of money passing through patient's account. And if you look at what patient is actually doing, there's money coming in and money going out again. So you borrow the money from patient, you're using it to hire workers. They're producing goods in a factory, which I'm doing implicitly here. You then flog the goods to patient and inpatient, and a bit yourself as well, because you're getting part of the profits, and, and on goes the system. So there's a turnover period. And the turnover period, I can relate to how long it takes to go from having money to selling it and getting a profit back. So I'll call this turnover. And I'll say, what sort of rate of turnover am I likely to be reasonable? Let's say it's every three months, which is one quarter of a year. So I'm then going to divide the amount of money in patients account by the turnover rate to give me an annual rate of turnover of money in the economy. And then to work out what wages are, workers are going to get 70% of that as wages. So I just wire that up. And I've now calculated what wages are. Finally, I've got to talk about consumption by workers and consumption by the patient agent. And I'm going to relate that to the amount of money in their accounts, again using the idea of a time constant, and saying the amount of consumption by workers is going to be uh, equal to what's in their account at the moment, divided by how often they turn over their account. Um, so I'll call this, I'll use a simple tau. I'm ultimately going to make this into something which is uh, you could use Greek letters for because the, the, the symbol, you know, if you use T for time, the Greeks use tau for T. So tau is often the term that's used to indicate a time constant for workers. And I'm going to say this time constant is about 0 0.02, which is one week, one fiftieth of a year, roughly. So I now divide the amount of money in that account by the time constant. What I'm arguing is that workers turn over the amount of their accounts roughly every week living from week to week. Whereas patient agent, A because he's more, you know, more frugal and responsible, and A because he's got a stash more money, uh, is going to do the same thing with a much um, lower time constant, meaning rather than rather than spending what's in the account on a weekly basis, let's say that our patient agent has a time constant of roughly a year. That it take patient a year to spend all the money in his or her account. So bring down a divide by symbol, wire that up. And now I've got a model. I hope I've done the, you, you always make mistakes in these things when you try to do them live, but let's see how I go. So now let's take a look at the amount of money in patient account and the amount of money in inpatient account. See so if I did the stuff up. If I did, I'd, I'll load one I've already properly wired without making an error and setting it up. So feed that over there. There's my amounts of money. And let's simulate. There you go. Money transfer from patient to inpatient. Good. I didn't stuff up. That's unusual when you do a live demo. 
Let's now also take a look at aggregate demand. As I've said, aggregate demand is the turnover <coughs> of money in the in the patient agent's account. Hang on. Ah, there's a bug. Great. I'll just try redrawing it and see where it's got to. Somehow I managed to delete patient. Let's bring him back again. Back it over here. Wire it up again. Okay, just make sure it works. Yep, okay. Let's now, I'm going to copy that. I accidentally chose delete. Okay. At the moment, we don't support copying a group of icons. You've got to copy each one at a time, but that'll be, that'll be fixed up uh, in the next month or so, I hope, in the software. But now we have, now let's wire that up. So now, I'll just label this, just to make it obvious what it is. Let's create another variable. I'm going to call this ag demand, ag, ag, ag demand for aggregate demand, and then wire that up and say what's aggregate demand in this system. And as Krugman argued, <coughs> aggregate demand reaches a constant level. Now I've, I've got that, aha, it's gone from a high level to a low level, okay. But aggregate demand is running at a constant level. Again, we haven't quite got the display of those equations being all that legible, but you've got a constant level of aggregate demand and transfer of money from patient agent to the inpatient agent, which is the vision that Krugman has of what lending is all about. So let's, I'll save that. There's no all file commands support that we've got to go and choose save from the menu. Having done that, now let's take a look at what the post-Keynesian model is. And that argues what you've got happening, and I'll bring up the, to get it done more rapidly, I'll bring up the one I've already saved here. Let's see. For this case, has the initial loan being a loan from the bank to the impatient agent. So there's your initial loan. Then lending continues with the bank lending to the impatient agent. Now to pay interest, the impatient agent is paying it not to the patient agent, but to the bank. So I've now got the safe and the money's been paid in there. And of course I have a consumption by the bank. I've got consumption by the workers again. Uh, or rather the wage payment by the workers, consumption by the workers. And now patient is turning up as the owner of the firm sector. So patient is being paid dividends by the firm sector and then patient can consume from that. And I've added in one more element of realism and that is that the patient agent is going to repay the loan over time to the patient agent. That's the overall system there. And much the same idea applies. I've got here the, the rate, of, rate of lending coming out of the bank being a, a time constant, giving the amount of money in the accounts already, interest on loans, consumption by workers, uh, turnover of the economy, the patient agent, workers' turnover rate, and patient consumption of the rate of payment of dividends by the firms affected to the capitalists, consumption by the patient agent, consumption of the rate of repayment also being a time lag variable. And here's what, how does that system differ? The key one is aggregate demand, but you'll see pretty obviously how they differ. You get growing aggregate demand over time. Okay. So that's the difference. That's fundamentally the difference between the two visions. At least a very different vision of how the economy operates. So that's the stuff. So loanable funds, there's no impact of lending, and you can forget about the economy. I've embedded the model inside there. You can all download the software package, have a play with it on your own PCs if you like. There's a version for Mac as well as a version for Windows. Anybody who's a real um, nerd, they can compile their own Linux version as well. Any Linux users here? Yeah, there'll be a couple in Parameter, I think. So aggregate demand grows as debt grows. It's a very different vision of the role of banks and why they are <coughs> essential to understanding capitalism from this point of view. So who's right about banking? Well, as well as having the empirical data in our support, we've also got you know, ages in which some very practical central bankers have been trying to tell economists that the post Keynesian vision is correct and the neoclassicals are wrong. The change in debt adds to aggregate demand. So banks create credit money by extending a loan, and the loan adds to spending power without reducing the spending power of savers, the neoclassical point. I've shown you the empirical data. I'm repeating myself here. Again, I've got to check these bloody slides out. Okay. <laughs> I had the, I must have changed the slides around for uh, talking about Alan Holmes and the European Central Bank, but I'll get to those in a moment. So, 
what, what I have is income coming out of the circular flow plus the change in debt. And the general rule being expenditure equals income plus the change in debt. Where income is always positive, but the change in debt is normally positive, but it can be negative. If anybody's either reducing their debt level or you've got a, a crisis going on. So I'm arguing that we have to actually to redefine aggregate demand. And here's the, 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 the double counting accusation coming from beforehand. So the basic insight is that you can spend out of what you buy and sell um, or taking funds from a saver with a neoclassical vision. Um, with the post-Keynesian vision, aggregate investment can exceeds retain, retained earnings and aggregate consumption exceeds distributed income. And you've also got speculation being financed by debt as well. So I now want to go through the mathematical logic. Okay. So, income starts from being wages plus profits. You can divide all income into wages or profits. And I can divide profits into profits the firm actually distributes versus profits it hangs on to, to reinvest or whatever, retained earnings. So in income, the GDP measure by income is going to come into measured wages, measured distributed profits, and measured retained earnings. Now expenditure is going to be money spent buying into consumer goods or capital goods. So the expenditure method will be classifying goods as consumer goods or investment goods and adding up the total spending on both. And there's two sources of demand for consumer goods. Workers can buy them or, cons or capitalists can. Now, if in both cases, if, cap if workers borrow money to buy consumer goods, then that doesn't, again, on the, on the endogenous money case, that doesn't mean somebody else has to spend less. So aggregate spending is wages plus the change in debt. But workers can also be reducing their debt level, so that can be negative. Did for capitalists. They, they consume more than income. They borrow money to do it, but they can also pay that debt down so they can be saving as well. And for investment, you have either invest out of retained earnings or new debt. So I bring this expression up. And therefore, borrowing for investments can also be negative. So firms can be borrowing money or they can be reducing their debt level. Let's compare the two equations. There's starting from the expenditure equation. First of all, including what consumption is and what investment is, and then whacking in what consumption by workers is and consumption by capitalists, so it's getting nice and messy. And rearrange that, there's your definition. Income, as measured by the expenditure method, is those three things <coughs> plus the change in debt. Subtract income from it, and you get the cancellations. So you've got expenditure minus income is equal to the change in debt. It probably still sounds like double counting. And that's, I think, the real source of this is the confusion between what Keynes called ex ante, the Latin before the event, and ex post after the event. <clears throat> because is, when you do the, when you look at the national accounts, there's a recorded identity of income and expenditure. When you do it after post, they are exactly the same. Even though I'm arguing they differ before the event, and for economic analysis, you have to work ex ante. And this is because the debt injections occur at discrete points in time. You imagine a flow of wages and profits going on, and then somebody borrows some money and spends that. You've got a discrete injection into what's happening on a regular basis. And they add it in at that particular time. Now, after the time, it's boosted incomes. So when you borrow the money and use it to buy something off a retailer, the retailer, after you've bought it, can count that as an increase in their profits and wages and whatever else. But before it, it's not there. Okay? It's got to, to actually have the income, you've got to have the borrowed amount. But once you record it, you get the same level. And the picture, this is what it looks like. And this picture was drawn by Matthias Grisselli, who's my professor of mathematics colleague at the Bills Institute where I spent the semester break. And the way this actually came about is quite a nice little story. Um, Matthias actually was the one who suggested the mathematics I've just shown you. And we were working away for a while, I said, let's come and have a crack at this. The Fields Institute has got blackboards everywhere, and being the deputy director, he's got one on his, on his wall, about the size of the wall of this lecture theatre. And I thought, this is going to be a waste of time. I didn't say it, but oh well, you know, I can't see this leading anywhere, but I'll, you know, he's posting me, so I'll, I'll humor Matthias and go through the exercise. And we derived that result, which surprised me. And then I sent that to Scott Fawilla and Stephanie Kelton, who came up with the seminar with us, and, and Michael Hudson. They all said, yep, no problem, still agree with it. 
I sent it to Mark Lavoie. He said it's still wrong. Mark Lavoie won't, won't admit it. So Mark Lavoie's records are making double counting mistakes. I actually wrote a blog entry on that point. So it still wasn't accepted at this stage. And in the discussions with Stephanie and Scott, Scott started raising the fact that economists normally, or neoclassical post-Keynesians, when they do dynamics, have what they call period analysis. So you define a period of time and have things happening in that period of time, and there's the next period of time, cutting time into discrete lumps. And over that period analysis, you get an exact identity of expenditure to income as part of what they use in uh, the book that Mark Lavoy wrote with Gwyn Godley to teach or develop dynamic modeling uh, the, what they call the, the social accounting matrix, SAM approach, and so on. So, Matthias left that particular day, being really, really troubled. And I thought, and he's saying, I, I can't reconcile this, our mathematics with this period stuff. And I went, oh, God almighty. Now, having just got somebody mathematically skilled on side, I was about to lose him in this whole confusion of period analysis and ex ante and ex post. So I was quite concerned when that particular day finished. I went to my back to the, the, the lousy little bedsit I was staying in. Matthias went back home to Hamilton, about 80 kilometres away. Came back the next morning, he's quite a character, he's very jaunty. You, you'd like him, you've got a good sense of humour, very funny. A mathematician who cracks jokes. And the mathematician's joke that he still cracks jokes, he's quite a funny guy. So he walks inside the room, and goes, well, I'll give you one of his favourite jokes. You know the story recently when, when a bunch of businesses thought they'd found faster than the light travel by neutrinos? You remember seeing that at all? Okay, some physicists did an experiment where they, a neutrino, you know what a neutrino is? Okay, you know, particle that is so, has, doesn't interact with other particles at all, so it travels at the speed of light. But these guys did experiments and they found that they found some neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light. It pretended being a furphy, it wasn't actually, it was an experimental error. But anyway, so the joke goes, and the bartender says, I'm sorry, we don't serve faster than light neutrinos here. Two neutrinos walk into a bar. <laughs> he has better than that. That's what that's what it's stuck in my mind. Anyway, so he's, he's a comical bloke. Hey, listen, I'll get into doing the on. So he, well, he'll be actually coming to Kansas City, so he'll be able to crack some of his jokes. Is it at Kansas City? And the intriguing thing is, he's he did professor of, of mathematics. <coughs> he did his PhD in a particular application of quantum mechanics. So the guy's got mathematics to, to slaughter anybody in the economics by, and he's coming to the post keynesian conference. He's going to be putting his analysis there. But he's got a capacity to communicate that most mathematicians, well, I, I certainly regard him as a better communicator than most mathematicians I've met. So it should be intriguing seeing what it's like with the post keynesians reacting to him at that conference. But anyway, so he went off home and came back, and he walked and said, walks jauntily into my room and says, I've got something to show you. Come and take a look at this. This is what he had for me. He said, what you're looking at is a flow of income over time. This is this bit here. And then a discrete injection of debt at a particular point in time. So here we have income at time t. And then there's a change of debt at time t. And there's expenditure at time t. That's the visual picture. There's a break there. Now, the measured time, if you measure looking back this way, you're actually looking backwards in time. And as a mathematician would define that as looking for the value of something by looking for its limit as you approach time from above. And that's what that symbol means. This point up here is the measure you have for income by looking at time from the future and looking back. Okay? So that's the formal definition of it. I, I can't quite, the T plus should be shown differently on the, uh, on the graph there. It doesn't work all that well with math type and what it can Represent, but that's the basic idea. It's the limit as you approach time in reverse, so you're looking at recorded income at that point of time. That's ex identical to expenditure at that time. But then you look at the full expression, you're going to say why expenditure at time t is equal to measured income at time t, measuring from the the future and looking back, and that will be income at the point in time plus the change in debt. So the two arguments are quite consistent, but it goes beyond that. That's just showing it all. I think that's probably everybody here can follow that argument. The additional point, which he was really delighted by, is that you have the flows of expenditure and the flow of income coinciding, except where there's an injection of debt. 
And that's a point of discontinuity that makes a absolute jump in the function. It's not something you can smoothly integrate. There's a, you know, no, you get the limit from below is different to the limit from above. Okay. Now, there's a definition. If you have to measure expenditure income over a period of time, then you are not going to have those points of discontinuity. You're going to go from one point of the continuous flow to another point of the continuous flow. And in the middle of that, there'll be a whole lot of discrete points where the two curves differ at a discontinuity. And according to a, the theorem of mathematics coming from what's called the Berg integration, which is something you've got to do a maths degree to start learning, by definition, those two integrals will be precisely the same. It's a rule of mathematics. The functions that differ only if there are not be many discontinuities must have identical integrals. And since what you're doing by measuring is effectively doing the integration over that range, you're going to find they're equal. And that's the thing I think is confusing people about this issue, being able to say that expenditure is income plus change in debt, <coughs> and if you measure the two, you will find them identical. So to me, this is a bit like a quantum mechanical discovery in economics, and it's actually the same sort of thing. This discrete element we've been leaving out of our thinking is an essential part of understanding how capitalism functions, because those discrete injections, discontinuities, are what debt really is. So that's why it's not inconsistent at all. So let's keep on going now. This, this is mathematically it's a watertight argument. Empirically, it stands up, but it's, it, it transforms how we think about expenditure and income and aggregate demand in the capitalist economy. But the other side, of course, is you don't just spend your money buying goods and services. You also buy assets, existing assets. So if I consider how that's financed, of course, you can get money for finance for speculation by using part of your distributed profits to speculate, or you can borrow money to speculate. And therefore, the money you buy, you, you use, the additional money of what you've already got in the existence, is talking about topping up the money that's already in the asset market, is going to be the distributed profits you use for speculating, plus the change in debt, which of course can also be negative. You can be liquidating your assets and so on. And ultimately, the same cancellations apply. You go through to the cancellation I showed you a moment ago, and you get expenditure being income to pay change in debt, where that includes money borrowed to gamble on asset prices. And so you get a very, very different version of macroeconomics coming out of this, where the change in debt plays a necessary role in both boosting the economy during a boom, but also causing a slump, as we're seeing now. And then government debt comes in. Of course, government is created in the same fundamental way, but through a different banking sector. Rather than creating by the private sector creating debt, it's now the government sector creating debt. So you now have expenditure includes net government spending. Well, we know that's the change in government debt. The way your cancellations, you get the same basic idea. Government debt, the change in government debt turns up there as well. So this is this particular result is something I still have to convince most post Keynesian on. Hopefully, I manage to do that at the seminar in um, in two weeks' time in in um, Kansas City. But it's a necessary consequence of having them seeing the money flies endogenous. If expenditure is partly debt financed, and that debt finance doesn't involve uh, the, the spender losing spending power, so the borrower gets it, there's no loss for a so-called saver, then aggregate demand differs from income. And it'll normally exceed when the economy is growing, which is short, which Schumpeter argued, and Minsky as well, it'll be less during a slump. But Minsky, this is also intriguing, this is what I was trying to find the equation earlier on today and I couldn't quite locate it all, include it when I um, put, a new, put this up on a set of slides. Minsky was trying to do the same thing, to grapple with how can you have debt rising and contributing to the economy while you have sectoral balance. This is a 1963 paper of his, Can It Happen Again? Okay. Back when he was still at the stage of trying, because he was mathematically trained, he was trying to work out a mathematical re reconciliation with the ideas he was getting by extending Schumpeter and looking at debt and Ponzi schemes. And he said, in a closed economy, you've got sectoral balance. Okay. He said, so if you find that surplus, it's his gross cash receipts minus his spending. He said another equation, which was then, I think I'll find that's a summation equation, summing over in sectors. Now looking at it, he said that's an ex post accounting identity. He said, he said each of those equations is the result of observed investing. 
x post. Okay? So what you're seeing when you do the sexual balance is what you observe at the end of something. You said, but they, they actually they are the result of market processes which are have not necessarily consistent ex ante saving and investment plans, and if they're reconciled in the system itself. So they're right, they're reconciled, and this is the quote I had beforehand, now fleshed out in more detail. If they are to be reconciled, then financial markets must generate an aggregate demand that's ever rising. And for that to happen, therefore, spending has to be greater than received income. And there must be some technique to enable that to be financed. He said, it follows, therefore, that part of demand is financed by sectors going into debt. And then he says, for that to succeed in raising income, then there can't be reductions in spending power by the units. The whole increase in spending by the borrower can't be matched in a negative way by the decline in spending by the saver. So, so therefore, what you're going to have in ex-post is some sectors will get larger surpluses than they anticipated, but not because of a reduction in spending by other groups. He said, for this to take place, it is necessary for some of the spending to be financed by the creation of new money. It all holds together, and it's all in Minsky. This is the intriguing thing. So, you know, I'm not the first to discover it, but I've managed to formalise it. And it comes out of Minsky. This growing debt is an essential part of capitalist, the capitalist economy, and you can reconcile this ex ante difference with ex post equality. All stuff which was Minsky hadn't quite worked it out, but it was there in him. Now, standard thinking has recorded expenditure with recorded income, ignoring, unfortunately, because of this very simple problem of confusing the two, that expenditure exceeds income. And again, you can find Keynes being aware of this, but only in, after he finished the general theory and his involvement in his debates with Olin and so on about what the general theory actually meant. And he said, there's a possible source of confusion of a, a, that an investment decision involves a demand for money before it is carried out. This ex ante and said, therefore, planned investment may have to secure its financial provision before the investment takes place. He said, there has to be a technique to bridge the gap. Again, you can see that Keynes inspired Minsky to some extent in this area. I'm not sure that Keynes, Minsky had read Keynes by 1963. I'll need to take a look at that. I think he read Keynes later. So maybe an independent will realize coming from Schumpeter. Keynes then says, this service may be provided either by the new share market, i.e., new shares, or the banks. Now, it's wrong to say it makes no difference which one, but the same idea about growing money being necessary to enable aggregate demand to be greater than income. So you get this set of outcomes, and therefore expenditure differs from income most of the time. And as I said, it's still the case that a lot of endogenous money theorists haven't realised this yet. So this is uh, Randy Ray's primer on modern monetary theory, which I hope I can get him to amend after after um, meet up again in Kansas City, and he starts from the macro accounting, starting from the recognition that the aggregate level spending equals income. Now that's ex post. Or you get with uh, Bill Mitchell the argument that expenditure is less than income. This is Mitchell making a case emphasizing his normal argument. He says he's actually saying the government sector spends less than the income it gets, it normally saves. Therefore, spending is less than income, he's arguing. And therefore, if that was the case, there'd be unemployed resources the government has to spend to make up the gap. Now, again, that's confusing ex ante with ex post. And Minsky, if he didn't confuse it, then argues the most important point for Minsky's extension to Schumpeter that this extension of debt enables Ponzi speculators to be active. So Ponzi finance uh, is, is a unit that's, whose income flow is less than their interest payments, let alone less you know, spending more than they earn, they're not even earning enough to pay the interest bill. Okay. So they're fundamentally bankrupt. So the only way they can actually remain in business is by borrowing money. So the only way they can keep on functioning is by the banking sector giving them that money. And therefore the banking sector is financing Ponzi, Ponzi behaviour and therefore financing an asset bubble because the only way Ponzi can ultimately finance it is they've got to sell an asset at a higher price. So the Ponzi's are also intimately tied up with the banking sector. And without the banking sector giving them money, providing debt for them, Ponzi's couldn't operate. So there's a fundamental link again between Ponzi uh, finance and the financial crises. 
and banks. So you've got to now include this role of changing debt in your overall analysis. <coughs> so you've got GDP plus the change in debt, and the now you are know, spending that money buying not just goods and services, but also buying financial assets. So it now gives you a debt-based explanation for asset bubbles like the one we've just been through and we're still going through. And now I think I've just jumped far enough to take a bit of a, you mind having a bit of a, a third session today? Yeah, a bit of a break on this one. I feel like I better check and see where the hell I'm going with this. I've been really shuffling this lecture around before I gave it to you guys. So let's leave it there. Get some lunch and come back in 10 minutes or so.